Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of words before, uh, before I begin. We're all watching closely the events taking place in the region. We will hear in a few hours President Trump's assessment of the reported Iranian missile strikes on bases where we have American military personnel stationed. Initial assessments are positive, and we pray those reports are true. Our military is by far the strongest in the world, and our cause is just. We pray to God that we will prevail overwhelmingly and without loss of innocent life. I am confident that with the President's leadership, we will defeat the great threats of our time and bring about a more just and a more peaceful world. So I'd like to begin by extending a warm welcome to all the ministers and members of the Knesset in attendance, many of whom I've gotten to know quite well over the past three years, including, of course, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Foreign Minister Israel Katz, and Defense Minister Naftali Bennett. My thanks to the sponsors of today's conference, Professor Moshe Kapel, Professor Eugene Kantorovich, and the entire Kohela team. We have spent some time together these past three years, and I am grateful for the observations and the insights that you have generously shared with me. A little bird has told me that you may be discussing today what you refer to as the Pompeo Doctrine. It's a great name. I'm glad you came up with it. It's the determination, of course, by the Secretary of State that Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria are not categorically illegal under, under international law. It may shock you to hear that I am in complete agreement with Secretary Pompeo. He is a brilliant and fiercely honest representative of the United States. It is my great privilege to work alongside him in executing President Trump's agenda. An agenda, I might add, that correctly supports Israel in an unprecedented and positive manner to the betterment of both America and Israel's safety and security. Serving as the United States Ambassador to Israel, now coming up on three years, has been by far the greatest honor of my life. As the U.S. Ambassador to a critical ally in a dangerous region, the job is a full-time effort, just with regard to traditional bilateral issues such as commerce and trade, military cooperation, cultural exchanges, intelligence sharing, political engagement, and receiving American delegations. But since coming here, I've tried to add one more item to a busy agenda. Working with the administration, working with the Prime Minister, to help to find a fix to the issues that still linger after the Six-Day War. Apart from perhaps the 1948 War of Independence, the 1967 Six-Day War may be the defining moment of the modern state of Israel. In just six days of battle, Israel tripled in size, gained critical buffers against its enemies, reunited Jerusalem, and demonstrated to the entire world that it was here to stay. In the years that followed, Israel entered into peace treaties with two of the warring nations on its border, Egypt and Jordan, and it returned over 88% of the land that it captured. But it didn't make peace with everyone, and when we came into office, the lingering issues included three of significant importance. First, the status of Jerusalem. Second, the status of the Golan Heights. And third, the status of Judea and Samaria. And we have approached these issues, as I like to say, in ascending order of complexity. With regard to Jerusalem, we were assisted by a 22-year-old statute passed overwhelmingly and reaffirmed in subsequent years, again, overwhelmingly, by the United States Congress. From any and every vantage point, whether United States law, biblical history, or simply the facts on the ground, it was undeniably true 
that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. After the Jerusalem Embassy Act was passed in 1995, I anticipated that the recognition by the United States of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel would occur immediately. If you read the statute, which I am one to do as a recovering lawyer, there is an affirmative mandate for such recognition. While the move of the embassy was subject to a presidential waiver on the basis of national security, there was absolutely no basis in the statute to waive the recognition itself. There was no waiver feature with regard to the recognition of Jerusalem. And for 22 years, I watched from a distance as this law on the books of the United States was simply ignored by Republican and Democratic presidents alike. I thank God that President Trump had the courage and the wisdom to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and the other embassy. And move our embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, where I now go to work and I urge all of you to come visit. I was in the room among a handful of senior members of the Trump administration in 2017 when this issue was analyzed and debated. I won't say what went on in that room, although others have been less shy, but I will say that I will never forget that meeting or the understanding, analysis, and leadership that President Trump brought to the table. In 2018, we turned our attention to the Golan Heights. It was obscene, obscene to think that the Syrian regime, a regime that lost the Golan after attempting to annihilate Israel, and which, since 1967, has led the world in barbarism against its own people and others, could even compete with Israel on a claim to title. The President understood this and recognized as well the strategic importance to Israel of the Golan. He acted quickly and decisively to recognize Israel's sovereignty. In reaching his decision, the President had also requested our views on the legality of the recognition. Some of you may be familiar with the analytical piece authored by Secretary Pompeo and me on the subject that was published in the Wall Street Journal. As we state in that article in greater detail, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242, the agreed upon architecture for the resolution of this conflict, requires territorial concessions by Israel only, only in exchange for, quote, peace within secure and recognized boundaries, close quote. In recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, President Trump evaluating the continuous malign and barbarous threats posed by Syria, concluded that no northern boundary for Israel would be secure except the boundary that incorporated the Golan. He acted well within the language of Resolution 242. And now we come to Judea and Samaria, certainly the most complicated of the issues because of the large indigenous Palestinian population. Balancing security considerations against the freedom of movement, reconciling competing historical and legal narratives and entitlements, attempting to aid the economy in the face of accusations of attempted normalization. It's complicated and it's challenging. But over the years, and certainly since before we came into office, it's only gotten more complicated and more challenging. The proverbial goalposts have moved and moved to the point today where when we came into office, the goalposts were no longer even on the field. Judea and Samaria, the name Judea, of course, says it all, is territory that historically had an important Jewish presence. As they say, it is the biblical heartland of Israel. It includes Hebron, where Abraham purchased the burial cave for his wife, Sarah, Shiloh, where the tabernacle rested for 369 years before the temple was built by King Solomon in Jerusalem. Beit El, where Jacob had his dream of the ladder ascending to heaven. Kasser al Yehud, where Joshua led the Israelite nation into the Promised Land. And John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and of course, so many other famous locations. After the Ottoman Empire fell 
Judea and Samaria, along with the rest of what was then referred to as Palestine, became subject to a British trust, which was subject, of course, to the Balfour Declaration, the terms of the San Remo Conference and the League of Nations mandate. In simple terms, the British were obliged to facilitate settlement of the Jewish people in this land. That's not to say that the Jewish settlement was exclusive. It's not to say that no one else had the right to live in Judea and Samaria. But the Jews most certainly did. We then fast forward to 1967 in the Six Day War. And after being attacked, Israel recovers Judea and Samaria from Jordan. Jordan had occupied Judea and Samaria for only 19 years, and almost no one recognized its rights to the territory. So intuitively, you don't need to be a PhD, you don't need a law degree. Intuitively, who has a good claim to this land? Is it Israel, whose historical and legal rights were recognized by the League of Nations? Jordan, which was there for only 19 years with virtually no legitimacy, and which in any event renounced its claim to territory west of the Jordan River in 1995, or the Ottoman Empire, which washed its hands of this territory after World War I? The answer, with all due respect to the scholars, is just obvious. And because it was so obvious, because the rights of Israel to settle in Judea and Samaria were so obvious, the goalposts started to move. The Armistice Line of 1949, a line to which the enemy of Israel, the enemies of Israel agreed to hold their fire until they rearmed and again sought Israel's destruction, as they did in 1973. All of a sudden, that Armistice Line became the inviolate Green Line, the limit of Israel's territorial entitlement. Settlements became, per se, illegal under amorphous notions of international law that no one could seriously reconcile with San Remo or the League of Nations mandate. And Resolution 242 became a mandate for Israel's withdrawal from all captured territory, even though the resolution was heavily wordsmithed to avoid such an interpretation, and even though the United States representative, our representative who negotiated Resolution 242, the dean of the Yale Law School, Eugene Rostow, has said that Israel has an unassailable right to settle in Judea and Samaria. The Pompeo Doctrine does not resolve the conflict over Judea and Samaria, but it does finally move the goalposts back onto the field. It does, not it does not obfuscate the very real issue that two million or more Palestinians reside in Judea and Samaria. We all wish that they live in dignity, in peace, with independence, pride, and opportunity. We are committed to find a way to make that happen. But the Pompeo Doctrine says clearly that Israelis have the right, Jews have the right, to live in Judea and Samaria. And it calls for a practical, negotiated resolution of the conflict that improves the lives of both sides. I won't tell you today how we're hoping to do that. Um, that's a scoop for another day. But we do invoke all of your ideas, and we invoke your prayers, and getting to that point, your help is very much appreciated. Your ideas are very much welcome. And so I will conclude by simply saying that may God bless you, may God bless Israel, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. <laughs>